Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and back there is Cindy Oliver and she's a doc. There's been a lot of mask debating going on since the start of the pandemic, which makes sense because it has provided a lot of extra opportunities for it. The problem is, though, that there are a lot of people doing it wrong, which means it may not be as satisfying for them as it could be. So why am I talking about mask debating now when it's been going on throughout the pandemic? Well, basically, it's increased recently because a new study has just been published. So let's have a look at the study and then we'll discuss some of the things that mask debaters are doing wrong. This is a study here. It's entitled Lifting Universal Masking in Schools, COVID-19 Incidents Among Students and Staff. And what they did in this study is that they compared COVID rates amongst staff and students in school districts in the greater Boston area that maintain masking requirements with school districts that remove them. So what did they find? This figure here shows COVID rates in schools before and after mask mandates were lifted. The dash lines indicate the first, second and third school weeks during which school districts lifted masking requirements. So before the dash lines, when everybody was masking, case rates were pretty similar. After the third dash line, most school districts had lifted masking requirements, but the black line represents the two districts where mask mandates remained in place. And the lines in varying shades of blue represent the districts that removed mandates. As time goes by, you can see the case rates in the various districts spread out. We have districts that kept masks on longer, doing better than those that took them off. And districts that kept masks on the whole time, doing best of all. You can see a simplified version of the data in this figure here, which shows the additional cumulative cases between districts that lifted masking and districts that sustain masking. The vertical dash line is the first reporting week in which masking requirements were lifted in each school district. And the blue shading represents the 95% confidence interval for the data. Prior to the mask mandates lifting, you see very similar COVID rates in all districts with a bit of noise around the initial Omicron wave which saw a huge number of people get infected. And then after the mandates are lifted, the number of extra cases in districts that lifted mask mandates becomes obvious very quickly. And by the end of 15 weeks, there is an additional 45 cases per thousand people. Right now, you're probably thinking, hang on, how do we know that the differences between the COVID rates are just a result of other differences between the districts, which is a fair question. And the authors did look at this. Whether or not mask mandates remained in place was up to the various school boards. So it was far from random. And therefore, it's possible that some of those things that led to a school board keeping masks in place would also lead to further COVID cases. That's how confounders work and how you can get false results in a study like this. And it turns out that districts that kept the masks on longer were different than those that took them off straight away. So let's have a look at how they were different. The districts that kept masks on longer had more low-income students, more Black and Latino students and teachers, and more students per classroom. These are all risk factors that are generally associated with an increased risk of COVID. So the confounding is actually the opposite of what you would expect to see if masking didn't work. 
The study authors also adjusted for other factors like vaccination rates, incidence of previous infection, community transmission of COVID and school district sizes. And the benefits of masking remained even after the adjustments. Another possible confounder is testing rates. Districts that did remove masks could have compensated by doing extra testing, except we know that didn't happen. If anything, the schools that kept masks on were testing more than the schools that took them off, which suggests that the results could be even stronger than reported. Now, this isn't a perfect study. There could be other confounders that the authors haven't identified, and also it's not actually looking at the effects of mask wearing. It's looking at the effects of mask mandates. A lot of people will choose to wear masks regardless of mandates. And that brings me to how people are mask debating the wrong way. A number of mask debaters are claiming that because this study isn't perfect, that means that masks don't work, which of course is an example of the fallacy fallacy. And if you'd like to know more about the fallacy fallacy, I've made a video about it and I'll provide a link to it in the video's description. But back to the mask debaters who are doing it wrong. The problem is they are looking at the study in isolation and ignoring all the other evidence. And sure, I know a lot of people like to mask debate in isolation, but in this case, it's just not the best way to do it. There have, in fact, been a large number of studies looking at the effectiveness of masking in reducing the spread of COVID. This table here appeared in a paper about the effectiveness of mask wearing to control community spread of SARS-CoV-2, which was published in JAMA in February 2021. And it includes 11 studies on the subject, all of which show that masks are effective in reducing community spread of COVID. And there have been numerous other studies published that come to the same conclusion since then. And I'll provide links to a few of them in the video's description so you can read them for yourselves if you like. Now, there are two issues with doing randomised controlled trials for mask wearing. Firstly, to eliminate bias in a randomised controlled trial, it needs to be blinded. And there is no way you can blind someone to the fact that they are wearing a mask. Secondly, ethics requires that the control group in any randomised controlled trial at least gets the standard of care. And the standard of care is to wear a mask in all high-risk settings. What bad mask debaters don't realise, though, is that we don't need any studies to tell us that masks work. We can determine it with physical testing. For example, this document here explains a procedure that is used to test N95 masks to determine that they really do filter out 95% of airborne particles. And there are similar procedures for P2 masks except the requirements to meet the standard is 94% instead of 95%. And there is nothing unusual about effectiveness of products being based on physical testing and not randomised controlled trials. Examples include seat belts, parachutes, motorcycle helmets and condoms. No one in their right mind would say they don't work because we haven't done RCTs. But bad mask debaters make these crazy claims about masks. Of course, not all masks are created equal. The standards that P2, N95 and other respirator masks have to meet are much more stringent than the requirements for surgical single-use masks. All types of masks have similar filtering requirements for larger three micron size particles, but only the respirator masks 
have requirements for the much more difficult to filter 0.3 micron size particles. That doesn't mean that other types of masks don't filter them at all, but they don't have to meet any particular standards regarding them. And of course, there are also cloth masks, which have no standards at all. This particular one is slightly better than a normal cotton mask because the middle layer is polypropylene, which is the same material that is generally used for surgical masks. The advantage of polypropylene over cotton is that while cotton relies on pore size to trap particles, polypropylene also traps particles electrostatically. But if the choice is a cloth mask or nothing, a cloth mask may still offer some protection over wearing no mask at all, as was shown in this CDC study. Although the 56% reduction in risk shown in this chart wasn't statistically significant. And of course, if you do have access to a respirator style mask like an N95 or P2, that is clearly the best option. However, for any mask to work well, it does actually have to form a seal around your face. If it doesn't do this, unfiltered air will just come in around the sides. This mask I've just put on, by the way, is a P2 mask that's made in Australia. Now, there are formal procedures for fit testing masks, but you can do a quick fit check whenever you put on a mask by simply breathing in and out. When you breathe out, you shouldn't feel any air escaping around the sides. When breathing in, a vacuum should be created, causing the mask to be drawn in slightly towards the face. And hopefully the video is clear enough for you to see that my mask was drawn in then. Another important thing worth mentioning is that although surgical masks and respirators are marketed as being single use, this study showed that they could be worn for up to 40 hours without any loss of effectiveness, although they did lose some effectiveness if they were washed. Finally, I would like to mention something that seems to get a lot of bad mask debaters in a lather, and that is mask mandates. Where I live in Sydney, Australia, we currently have mask mandates in all healthcare settings. Most people aren't bothered by this because they are not selfish assholes. They understand that the mandates are to protect vulnerable people who are in those settings who could suffer bad outcomes if they were infected with a respiratory virus. Bad masturbators, however, think this is an assault on their freedom. If you are one of these people, you really need to stop masturbating and have a look at the world outside of your own privileged life. Girls in Afghanistan don't even have the freedom to go to high school. Wearing a mask in certain settings to protect the vulnerable is at worst a minor inconvenience. One more final thing. There are some bad mask debaters who think that wearing a mask will rob them of oxygen or lead to a buildup of carbon dioxide inside the mask. This is about as dumb as thinking that something that sounds a bit like mask debating will make you go blind. The pore size in an N95 mask is generally 100 to 300 nanometers. An oxygen molecule is 0.12 nanometers and a carbon dioxide molecule is 0.232 nanometers. So neither will have any trouble passing through the pores. So if you notice any mask debaters who aren't doing it right and therefore may not be getting the satisfaction that they should, please share this video with them. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your 
medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And of course, thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee. I really appreciate your support. I will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to see them, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.